Joining me today is Maggie Monroe Castle, who's the director, executive director of TLC. Um, you know, April, Child Abuse Prevention Month, and we were talking about sort of the statistics and the cost um, in dollars, but the, the so, you know the 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 personal costs are huge as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we left talking about sort of this notion of a cycle. And, and I'm just curious, what are the things uh, that the average person can do to help someone else or to think about ways to break that sort of cycle? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and maybe that ties into some of the things that you you know, your organization does. Mm -hmm. But just, just to get a, a sense for what we can do across the, the, the listening area and really across the country, you know. Uh, there's, there's a lot we can do. Um, one thing I'll say right off that sort of encompasses a, a way to direct people is um, first to our website, but also to um, the, the Children's Trust, New Hampshire Children's Trust website, where there is all kinds of information about how your average person can get involved from a one-to-one -one with a family to getting involved with advocacy and funding on a statewide and federal level to help with this age group. So uh, I do you know, recommend people go to the Children's Trust website to learn a little bit more about that. Um, in answer to your question, I would really focus on two things. One is the advocacy. Uh, you know, we're in an election year and have we heard any of the politicians on either side or in between talk much about early childhood development. No. I, 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 so, as somebody who follows this, I actually can't recall that really coming up except that schools are important. Yes, um, and schools are one thing, but if those kids aren't ready for the schools, and that addresses the whole brain development issue, if we have not gotten in there when that brain is just shooting off, uh, you know, growing and expanding exponentially, uh, if we haven't gotten in there then, then we'll just be pouring money into a black hole if we're focusing only on the schools and not those early years that So talk to me a, a little bit that. about the cognitive development that, that research sort of shows on the first three months, three years, three... Well, it's interesting to me as a parent now of a 31-year-old, 30 years ago isn't that long ago, but they didn't talk about any of this stuff when I was a new mom. And now you, you hear so much about helping uh, parents understand the basic bonding and how that bonding and that nurturing that can happen, does not always happen between parent and child, that that in and of itself is just the holding of a baby. So, and, and I know you, you have a prop down here a, a, about that. <laughs> well, I do have a prop. Um, it, it was interesting in my first few months in this position, I, I did not come from a background of early childhood development to realize that when um, parents who have had themselves trauma in their childhood have not been nurtured, when they're handed even their own baby, they may hold the baby but be very still. Whereas, Whereas uh, those, parents who've had a rock? Right, I so. mean, most parents who've had a, a somewhat healthy childhood, if you pick up any small thing, a baby, um, sometimes even a puppy or a kitty cat, will rock. And so to realize that the trauma that, may, that that parent may have experienced as a child um, makes them it makes it very difficult for them to do basic nurturing. And it's that basic nurturing that that baby's brain needs. To, to uh, develop. To develop. That's sort of the, the bottom of it all. The bottom of the pyramid is make sure you have that bond and that that baby is secure. And so then his or her little neurons are gonna go wild and they're gonna pick up when you look down at that baby and smile at the baby. They're gonna shoot off in all kinds of directions. Um, it's not so much what we teach them as how we uh, love them and nurture them. So, I mean, that brings me to one of the projects you're wor that you're working with with, with Dartmouth uh, yes. is the Rocking Chair Project. This is an experiment uh, that we're just starting. The Rocking Chair Project is a national foundation that is out of Connecticut. And a pediatrician, a couple, a retired pediatrician and nurse started it with the idea that every new mom, but especially economically disadvantaged moms, you know, need a, 
a place to nurture themselves and to nurture their babies. And uh, they maybe don't, you don't even have the wherewithal to afford a rocking chair. So um, through us and through Dartmouth, they will be donating this chair, which will actually be built by the new mom, by the residents at Dartmouth, and by one of our home visitors to, to build a trusting team together. Oh. And uh, April is the first time we are initiating this. Uh, so you're the first to hear about it publicly. And in May, we're actually going to uh, make it public right before Mother's Day. But uh, today is actually the first time that we will be giving a rocking chair to a new mom. Um, you know, as our little brochure says, that research shows that holding that mom, or the holding the baby and rocking that baby and singing to that baby is way more important even than planning for that baby to go to Harvard you know, or some... Or Dartmouth. Or Dartmouth, <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> I should be careful there. And, and we forget that, that something uh, uh, as simple so, as a rocking chair. Right, so basic, such basic things, we forget how important yeah. they are. Yeah. And we're out of time in this segment. When we return, we're going to continue our conversation and probably shift to some policy yeah. issues. So please stay with us.